Joseph Stalin deported a lot of people to Central Asia. In the years leading up to World War II, something like 200,000 Koreans who were living in the Soviet Far East were uprooted and forcefully relocated to Central Asia, to places like Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan. And as the war began, the deportations continued. If you happen to live in one of the Baltic states, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, thousands of Estonians, tens of thousands of Latvians, tens of thousands of Lithuanians, all told something like 200,000 people from these states were uprooted and forced to relocate to you know, the far north or Siberia or Central Asia. See, what Stalin was trying to do, by the way, tens of thousands of these people are gonna die in the brutal process of deportation. What Stalin was trying to do in the case of the Koreans, sort of irrational, he saw the Koreans as a potential fifth column in the face of a Japanese invasion. As for the Baltic states, what he was trying to do was absorb those states into the Soviet Empire. He thought the best way to do that, at least one of the ways to do that, was to get rid of the old elite, get rid of the intelligentsia, and thus the deportations and the killings. A third of a million Poles will be scattered across the USSR, including here in Central Asia. Thousands and thousands will die in the brutal process. Because Stalin, he's going to straight up execute tens of thousands of Polish people. These are the old elites and the intelligentsia, as well as military officers. The Nazis will do the same thing, by the way, targeting the same type of people, straight up executing them. Why? Why would these people do this? Why would Stalin and Hitler do this? Besides the fact that they're Stalin and Hitler. Well, there's a logical reason. Again, these guys are trying to pacify a population. They're trying to turn Poland into a meek and submissive population of workers, laborers. And so they take out the elites, the intelligentsia, and the military officers through execution, and they scatter hundreds of thousands more, killing thousands in the process, as I mentioned. See, this is one of the, this is at least a, a more extreme demonstration of one of the major problems with highly centralized states. And of course, the epigee of centralization is a communist state. And if you like, we can go to the other end of the spectrum and point at a, you know, militantly nationalist or fascist state. Highly centralized states tend strongly to erase culture, to destroy diversity. And this is what they do because they impose from the center a uniformity, a regimentation. Okay, so Stalin was a brutal centralizer, as was Hitler. So it's no surprise that Stalin next turns his sights to those non-Russians within the Soviet Empire who are most resistant to his style of cultural leveling, most resistant to the collectivization we're talking here in particular about the Chechens and the English of the Northern Caucasus. Before we talk about the Chechens and the English, let's talk about the Crimean Tatars. In May 1944, Stalin deported the entire nation of Crimean Tatars out of their homeland, here mostly to Central Asia. The entire nation, I'm talking 200,000 people, all of them ejected from their homeland. Now. Years after the war had ended, talking 1956, when Khrushchev is allowing peoples formerly deported to return to their homelands, he leaves out the Crimean Tatars, probably because Ukrainian and Russian colonists now live in Crimea. They've taken over all the land. They even moved into some of the abandoned Tatar houses. So there's nowhere for them to go. So they are declared to be in exile in perpetuity by Khrushchev. To this day, there's a remnant of Crimean Tatars who hope to one day return to their homeland. Three months earlier, so now we're talking February 1944, both the Chechens as an entire people and the English as an entire people, collectively making up half a million people, were deported mostly here to Kyrgyzstan or north to Kazakhstan. And by the way, this took place in a matter of days. In a matter of days, both of these entire nations, complete peoples, were uprooted and deported. So you can imagine the brutality that must have been involved. Tens of thousands of Chechens and English died en route to Central Asia. Their bodies tossed off of overcrowded transport trains. And when they arrived here, 
what was waiting for them? The answer is nothing. No accommodations, no provisions, no food, nothing. And so over the next few years, many perished. In fact, according to official Soviet documents, a quarter of the English, a quarter of the Chechens died during this period. Chechen historians and English historians claim almost half died during this period. And to add insult to injury, not only were these people deported, uprooted en masse from their homeland, but once they got here, nothing was waiting for them, they were purposefully scattered among the local population. They were dispersed. They weren't together. They weren't kept together. The purpose being to dissolve them as nations. Now, according to one scholar whose work you know, specifically targets this phenomenon, the culture, at least that incarnation of the culture of the Chechens and the English died here in Central Asia. In 1956, when Khrushchev made his announcement allowing peoples to return home, deported peoples, back to their homelands, you can probably guess what happened to the Chechens and the English. Well, they were excluded. Like the Crimean Tatars, they were told that their exile was to be permanent. They weren't allowed to go home. Well, some went home anyway, armed and fighting. And many continue to fight the Russian regime to this day. Thank you so much for watching to the end. I really appreciate that. If you want me to keep creating content like this, consider becoming my patron over on patreon.com. Also follow me on Instagram where weekly I issue updates as well as a set of history challenges, a little more engagement there. It's a lot of fun. We'll see you there.